Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to my podcast, and thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I love bringing to you guests who are focused on their own growth and development and also helping people achieve their full potential. And that's really the focus of our company, too. We produce books and tools that help people connect more effectively with each other in the workplace. And you can learn more about us at Grow Strong Leaders. Com. Today, I have a very special leader that I want to introduce you to. You're going to really enjoy this conversation. Welcome, Dr. Beth Kaplan. Hi, Meredith. Great to be here with you and your guest today. Well, I am so excited to have you here and what we're going to be talking about, Beth, because it's so important. Let me tell my audience a little bit more about you before we jump into our conversation. Beth is a researcher and a storyteller with expertise in belonging, belonging in the workplace, and workplace trauma. Beth is currently conducting research and supporting the development of these areas as they inform the future of work. She's a big picture thinker and creative storyteller with 15 years of experience in learning and leadership strategy, and she's proven her ability to improve retention and transform company culture. Beth is currently the global head of leader development and enablement at Dassault Systems. Prior to this, she started leader development at Salesforce, not a small task with such a big company, and she's considered a thought leader in this space. Beth holds a master's and EDD in learning and leadership strategy from the University of Pennsylvania. So Beth, you have mm -hmm. a lot of academic credentials, a lot of experience, and I think it would be a great place to start to have you tell us about your journey into this very important topic of belonging. Absolutely. Again, Mer Meredith, thank you for having me. Um, for me, understanding belonging has been a lifelong pursuit. If I really look back at the patterns of my life, it's all clear how I came to be here. But one of the key factors that launched my research was a relationship that I had with a past manager. I'll never forget going into his office for my annual performance review, right? We've all been there, get a little nervous. Um, and he sat me down and he said, Beth, you are my best employee, the best I've got, um, you do great work. I just don't think you belong here. And hearing that felt like, oh my goodness, such a sucker punch to the stomach, right? I mean, after all, at the time, I ran most of onboarding for the company. I was the belonging cheerleader. I was constantly the one trying to really make people feel that they belonged with the company. Um, so after that conversation, I fell into such a downward spiral of doubt, self-loathing, that one sentence, that one line made me question everything about him, myself. His perception honestly became my reality as I carried the stigmas out, also really just around lack of belonging and belonging uncertainty. And I I mean, that, that was a terrible year. I gained 20 pounds. I My hair started falling out. I was exhausted all the time. I would wake up feeling exhausted. And it really got me thinking, really why I was in this state. You see, the need to belong is hardwired into our DNA. And when our brains sense that social rejection and that inclusion, we have a neural alarm system that goes off, right? It goes off in multiple directions. And it really tries to protect you against that isolation um, and around that social separation. And that, that's what was happening. And I was ignoring all the signs, everything. All I heard was you don't belong. Um, so this lack of social inclusion, this exclusion, it led to a lot of pain. I was in physical pain. I was stuck. And ultimately, it led me to quitting my job. And I quit it, the job. I got a new one, et cetera. Um, but before I did that, I talked to my boss. I had my exit interview with him. 
And interestingly enough, Meredith, I had told him about this, how how upset I was, all the things that were happening, and he didn't even remember the conversation. Ugh. Didn't remember it, but I did. And specifically, it stayed with me into the new job. And that really upset me. I couldn't understand why if I quit, why was I still feeling this way? So when I did, when I looked around and I did research, I couldn't find much around belonging in the workplace. And ultimately, that sense of alone, that sense of rejection became my passion. So I did research to be able to put it out there in the world to make people feel less alone when dealing with their own sense of belonging. Mm. You know, I could feel my own reaction when you when you said that statement that he said and imagining what it must have felt like to you who yes. put your heart and soul into this company, into yeah. making that very thing a reality. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I have to say these adversities that happen in our lives sometimes serve of an important purpose. And in yours, it served the purpose of making you passionate about this particular yeah. topic. And now look, let's look at the impact that's having on your work and all the people that you've worked with since then, because you have this extra radar <laughs> up there yeah. about this. And one of the things that I think is so interesting is, and I think would be important for my listeners to know is you have a unique definition of mm -hmm. what belonging means, but most people think of belonging in the workplace as something else. So I would love for you to compare and contrast sure there are most people and how they think about it and then what your definition is and why absolutely so most people hear the phrase belonging in the workplace and they think of diversity and they think of inclusion and while diversity and inclusion and belonging are all important they all have very different meanings but they're grouped together typically for a very noble cause, right? People want to do good things, corporations do, but they're very different. All really geared to, around promoting fairness in today's workplace, if you ask me. Um, but diversity goes beyond measurement of demographics, right? And as these differences um, come to be, we wanna embrace them as well as inclusion, right? So I'm not saying diversity and inclusion are not part of the belonging spectrum, but the reality is you could have diverse representation, diversity of thought in and inclusion and not necessarily feel a sense of belonging in the workplace. And to me, that is because diversity and inclusion are things that other people have to gr agree on, right? You have to be able to have their their input in a sense where belonging mm -hmm. is really decided by us. We decide mm -hmm. if we belong or not. Mm -hmm. So I define belonging as the innate human desire to be part of something larger than ourselves without sacrificing who we are. And that's probably what makes, you know, the last part of that definition is probably what makes it most unique. Because what I'm saying is that you have the ability to decide whether you belong or not. Mm -hmm. And if you're sacrificing who you are, then you're you're not going to feel a sense of belonging, right? Even though you may feel like you're part of something else, if you're not true to who you are, then belonging is often thwarted or you don't experience it, mm -hmm. experience it in general. That's such an important distinction. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, I was thinking about it really is the inside, you know, job. Some of those other aspects are external, but just like you carried that thought around in your head after mm -hmm. your boss told you that one statement and you carried it with you, this can happen to any of us when we experience something and we interpret it a particular way. And so we might withdraw. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an important question that may be in the minds of a lot of my listeners, which is mm -hmm. how do you actually bring this to life in the workplace? If if belonging is happening a lot inside a person, how do you make this real when they have to interact with others at work? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think that there's a few different things. I think just to go back to the definitions, right, when you talk about inclusion, inclusion is often confused with belonging because of the fact that it is someone allowing you in. And so people often mistake that quite a bit. However, in the workplace, you can have inclusion and belonging as sisters, not twins, if you think about it, right? So they're together, 
but at the same time, creating certain aspects that really pull out the belonging or what's what's key, right? Again, inclusion, you determine whether I belong, belonging, I determine whether I belong. Mm -hmm. So earlier on in my career, I would tell you belonging was all about moments, right? Creating a culture that celebrates wins or unique experiences and onboarding, um, anything that meant we're in it together, whether I determined that for you and as an inclusion expert or belonging expert by creating moments. And while I still think those are very important, now I really focus on the number one influence on an employee's sense of belonging, which is their manager, right? So taking a leader's first approach to all programs, making sure leaders are trained on really importantly how to lead, whether or not they are emotionally intelligent, and being conscious of the impact that they have on employees those are all the really big things we think about. On top of that, what we also look at is interference and removing it, right? There are certain triggers that happen with employees and their managers, and it's important for leaders to really understand what that looks like um, and creating corporate programs and policies to bring that out and to make our leaders stronger, which increases our employees' sense of belonging. Hmm. You know, We've heard for so many years the number one reason people leave organizations is because of something their manager does or doesn't do over mm -hmm. time that creates right. issues for them. And I think that element of belonging uh, it is a real key piece to that. And you just mentioned something that I think is important for us to look at, and that is programs and policies. Yeah. Those are two different things. And I know you make a real distinction between them. And there are a lot of companies now that have adopted, you know, DEIB programs and they're bringing in someone to head that up. But in your mind, if you were advising another uh, a counterpart in another company about all the lessons you've learned around this, first explain what's different in policies versus programs, and what can be done in each of those areas to make it a more effective workplace for, uh, I guess, facilitating a sense of belonging? So to me, programs are great change agents. I don't want to disparage programs altogether. They're these engines of action, if you will, right, that really try to get you to conduct business, serve a community, or measure something specifically. They have a related set of activities, typically with a long-term goal and a specific duration, and that's what's key. What I find with programs that make it difficult is that they usually have an end date, and I don't see them reinforced very well, right? If we were able to take programs and build that reinforcement on our culture, I would be all for it. And some do a really good job, whereas policies give you guiding principles for decisions and actions, right? They're the ones that inform your programs. So a company will have policies and procedures so that employees know exactly how to carry out what they're supposed to be doing so the organization runs smoothly. I often say that you need to start with the policies because those are your overarching principles. Those are where your values come into play. And a lot of times, those are where we have a lot of gray area with what I call unwritten rules, right? Unwritten rules are that you can't wear jeans into the office unless you've gotten written into your policy that jeans are not appropriate. Um, unwritten rule, a really good example would be time off, right? So a lot of companies have flexible time off or they have unlimited time off. But the reality is it's very taboo to take an unlimited amount of time off, right? And it causes a lot of creation of, of problems. In fact, when doing the belonging research, that's one that came up often is people felt like they had asked permission to live, <laughs> to enjoy their lives and their separate time mm. off. So it's really working to make your policies very clear, um, whether it be your dress codes, your time off, the relationship that you are having with an employee, professionally, of course, speaking, and in general, just trying to make sure that those policies are clear so that there's less ambiguity and more clarity. Mm -hmm. Well, let's think about policies that... Um, you've helped put into place in mm -hmm. places you've worked or perhaps have advised some folks, um, what would some policies be that facilitate, because you can't make policies to, you know, 
foster belonging overtly. You know, it's sort of like thinking about personality tests that have to ask indirect questions about whether someone's an introvert or an extrovert, for example, rather than asking them directly. When you're looking at forming policies, what kinds of policies would create an environment Mm -hmm. where, where that sense of belonging is strong? This is a really great question. I honestly look at the whole span of policies um, and there's some good reasons for that. For example, let's go with dress dress code. That's an easy, easy one to fix. A lot of companies have very outdated, antiquated versions of what their dress policy may be. Um, Recently, one of the first things I look for is how people are expecting women in particular to dress in the workplace, right? A lot of companies have policies against specific types of hair, right? So braids being one of them. And for me, you know, I really tried to look at the fact that who are they gearing these towards? And this is the fair policy of a standard that you're basing this off that everyone can adhere to. That's really important because when you single out um, a group based on specific hair types, you're going to actually create the opposite of belonging and inclusion and diversity. So there's a whole lot of Hmm. feeling there that I have. Um, Companies typically don't realize you know, why they put them in place to begin with when it comes to things like that in the dress code. And at the same time, they don't realize the impact it has on specific minority types that particularly value that diver- that culture or standing out, which we want to we want to embrace that. We don't necessarily want to take it down. So things as simple as your dress code, which is probably the easiest win that you could have, all the way going up to tougher policies and really looking at breaking down stereotypes of what we feel is an ideal worker mm-hmm. more towards what we feel is ideal productivity. You know, those are really good because what they get us to do is think about judgments we're making yes. uh, about whether something is good or bad, right or wrong. And these innate biases that we carry around with us that um, mm-hmm. inform the policies that we make, the decisions we make. And you know what? I was just thinking that's so interesting, Beth. If we don't have diversity of thought and ethnicity Mm -hmm. and ages and everything else, when we go to form our policies, we get into that groupthink, right? There's danger of of creating policies that sound good to those of us involved, but there are other people we haven't considered. Yeah, you know, a a big rule of thumb I like to talk to companies about is looking, going out on the street and looking at the average type of people you're seeing. That's what should be represented inside your company just as much as outside the company. And building rules that are creating a a fairness that applies to all, not just stereotypes of, um, you know, I can mention a a million stereotypes, but really trying to look at diversity for all. Mm-hmm. And making sure that there's fairness, which is which what companies are really trying to achieve. They just don't necessarily know how to do it. I'm curious too, because one of the things I know you've worked so hard on in your work is this area of attracting and retaining people. Yeah. And so talk about what you've helped companies do or what you're seeing some of these great places to work. Mm-hmm. What are they doing right when it comes to either their policies or their processes around uh, attracting the right people and able to retain them because those individuals feel that sense of belonging. So I think the companies that are doing it well are not, it's, it's really interesting. There's a lot of companies telling you that they're doing it well. I would challenge you to look at their quote unquote belonging reports. Most companies have been putting out things like a diversity, inclusion, and belonging report. The ones that do it well cover belonging in those reports. Um, it's so, I feel like I'm saying advanced common sense here, but I would, we, you'd be hard pressed to find anything belonging metric wise, right? And hmm. I think the companies that do it well are not simply trying to measure belonging in specific sentiment, but they're covering a span of what matters to their employees. And then they measure their belonging against whether, you know, meeting the employee where they're at. That's really key. So the other ones that do a great job or or those actually that don't, but are starting to care about belonging and really making a difference are looking at where it's costing them, okay? So the reality is most companies are for profit, <laughs> right? And they need to make money. So 
they know that replacing employees is very expensive. And lack of positive sense of belonging comes at a very high cost for these companies, right? Disengaged workers um, have a 37% absentee rating, right? They're 18% less productive. Um, and profitability ranges between 15 and 20% lower. So, you know, the other thing is disengaged employees quit at a much higher rate than engaged employees. And if we take a look at recruitment and legal fees for replacing those employees, it's astronomical. Um, so the total cost of losing an employee can range from tens of thousands of dollars to, you know, I would say one and a half to two times that, that employee's annual salary. So the cost, that's just one cost. The employee cost itself is not easy to quantify. The fact is, you know, it's difficult to know the extent of personal cost to employees because the employee is not as likely to tell you or speak up, speak up until they've left the company. So I always talk about this with, in, with um, employers that it's important to get this, to make sure that you understand what matters to them before they leave. And that sounds really common sense too, but many do not. And the reason they don't is they don't know what to do with the data they're collecting, right? So that's where companies like mine can come in um, and really do a good job at helping to really start breaking down what the issues are, the root causes, and then go from there. You know, you mentioned about measuring, Yes. Uh, you know, that they're not measuring. What kinds of questions, can you give just a few examples of questions that in your mind, the responses would indicate and give you some good data about whether there's an overall sense of people feeling like they belong or not. Can you give some specific examples that might be useful for my listeners? Yeah, I mean, I can give you some quick wins around retention, right? So right. belonging, like I said, belonging metrics are really specific to each company. It's a little harder to be able to broad sweep. But one of the things to note is when you want to look at tenure, if you look at new hires, for example, most of them decide whether or not they're going to leave or stay in the company within the first week that they are at the company, right? Oh and then goodness. there's very, yeah. So, I mean, really what they're looking at is whether or not they're going to leave. And then there is a statistic out there that over 20% leave within their first three months. And then that number increases as they get to the year mark. Most don't, I think it's less than 40% sometimes even make it to that to that number within the first year. So I would take a look at that to see where your what the average tenure is looking like when you bring someone to your company, how long they're lasting by group, right? Because what's interesting is we can talk about belonging at a, at a company level, but it's probably smarter to break it down by organization because what we've come to see is that these larger companies have a very deep culture within each organization that may even vary for the from the company directive, the company mm -hmm. values, if you will. So it's important to under, also understand whether those groups are living your values that you've set out as a company. And if they're not aligned, that's something to be aware of. That's a red flag as well. Mm. That's such an important point because even in a smaller company with small groups of teams, there's a, you know, a culture that can develop based on the leadership of that particular team. Yes. So thinking about leaders, you know, mm -hmm. and what you've said so far, so much of it does fall on a manager's shoulders and they're feeling pretty overwhelmed themselves in right. many ways today. And so they might be inadvertently saying or do things that cause people to say, I'm not going to be here for very long. Absolutely. What is it? So let's talk about some positive things mm -hmm. that you've seen some of the best leaders that you've worked with do to help instill that sense of belonging in the people on their team or within their whole company. So that's a great question. I think for me, what I've seen work really well is when leaders are generous with their time, when they give people the ability to control the narrative. For example, in one-on-ones with my direct reports, I don't create the agenda. In fact, I try not to add anything in there and it's hard. I wanna talk about, you know, do, 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 every list that you can think of, but giving them the opportunity to use that time with you is important. 
Also, speaking of opportunity, giving them opportunity, right? Especially when they're not in the room, making sure that you know at all times you're their advocate. It also means candor and praise and trust, right? I also like to say kindness. And when I talk about kindness, I'm not just talking about kindness in care and thoughtfulness, but I'm talking about the kindness that you need to set boundaries, right? Setting expectations and growth standards without diminishing people. Um, consistency with your expectations, transparency, you know, self-awareness, being intentional. You know, interestingly enough, though, Meredith, the number one thing that employees have told me through research and lots of development is what they want, right? So I've seen a lot of great things, but the number one thing that employees want, care. They want their managers to care about them. Mm. And care, again, number one answer, but that ranges, that range is deep, right? It's things like care to know more about me, my family, my life outside of work, to care to speak my name in a room that I'm not in, like I mentioned. Um, so it's really that general sentiment of feeling like we're in it together. That's probably the number one thing that employees mm. have told me that they want from their managers. I just love that. I love everything you just said, Beth, because yeah. what it speaks to really is the common human need we all have, which yeah. you said at the very beginning. Right. And it seems so simple, and yet we get caught up in the pressures of getting things done that mm -hmm. somehow we think, I don't have time for that, when in fact, that's the most important use of your time. I, yes. I'm so excited that you brought up this idea of spending time yes. with the people on your team individually and then letting them set the agenda. So they, this, one of my core values is thinking about how can I value this person who's yes. right in front of me? How can I help them appreciate their own value mm -hmm. in this moment? And by allowing them to speak their truth or talk about things that are important to them personally, you're giving them that space. Yes. This to me is the crux of yeah. someone feeling that they belong because what you said, that sense of caring about me, mm -hmm. I just, I think that's so powerful. And I really hope my listeners are absorbing that and realizing that's, it takes the self-awareness of when, it, when can I do this, right? How can I set my own ego, my own needs aside in order to be fully with this person right now. Yeah. And if you think about it, it doesn't require as much time as you think. Mm -hmm. And it pays dividends in the long run in terms of the retention, the loyalty, the the sense of I'm on this team and I love my team. You know, that that yeah. feeling that you're really with it. That and if you think about it, as leaders, that's why we got into leadership. Right. So let's be very honest. Most people are promoted into management because they were good at their jobs. And that's not necessarily what you want to see, but that's it. And I mean, I'll tell you, honestly, I was never given leadership training when I started. I mean, eventually in my career I was, but I was, you know, who, people got me because I was good at my job and you learn in between. Uh -huh. And my goal was always to care about people, always to coach and grow them as most leaders. But we get lost in that especially when the reality is no one really teaches you how to lead. So a lot of the focus in the leadership development that I do is teaching people how to lead. You know, it's not enough um, to have followers, but you want people to want to follow you. Mm -hmm. That's really key. Um, and I think a lot of leaders would tell you that that's what they're, where they feel like they don't have time on a daily basis. So creating a structure of like the agenda that I told you where the Folks will, you know, read me their agendas. It it shows the people that work for me, hopefully, or work with me, that I really care about what they have to say and helping them be their best, be their best selves. Well, and, you know, the other thing, as I'm reflecting on this, that it does, that to me is such a gift to the other person, is you're helping them see how capable they are. Yes. of thinking, of handling situations. And that builds confidence. I think that's mm -hmm. a core aspect of an effective leader is helping others feel more confident in right. their abilities, their capabilities, 
so they can take on more responsibilities, no matter what their title is, right. and do it with the sense of this person believes in me. Absolutely. I mean, there's confidence and there's safety. And there's so many concepts, especially nowadays that we've been talking about as terminology has become more common. Um, you know, you want people to feel like it's acceptable to almost fail. I don't fail isn't failure is an interesting word. I don't believe that you fail until, until you decide to quit. That's the truth. But not maybe be your best. And you want leaders to to make people feel that that's okay and that they're going to learn and they're going to grow and it's not going to be held against them for life, um, which is really hard. And we spend so much time in the workplace to feel that bad is just not productive and it's starting to really take over people's mental and physical well-being. Yeah, it sure does. And that kind of leads into the other topic I want to make mm -hmm. sure we address before I let you go. And that is about workplace trauma because mm -hmm. that's very real too. So yes. and that's something I know you've devoted a lot of time to. So let's talk about what does that mean to you when you say mm -hmm. that phrase and and what's what are the issues around it? Sure. Oh, apologies for that. Um, my dog clearly wants to get in the conversation. Um, so <laughs> workplace trauma is such an interesting topic, unfortunately. It's still very taboo for many companies, I think. Um, you know, part of me thinks that it's because it's harder for companies to be able to see the forest through the trees, or maybe they just have that good old sunshine pump flowing, right, where they believe everything's rosy. Um, then they get surprised when employees are doing things like publicly resigning. Um, and they're deep that, you know, I don't know if you've seen, there's just this big influx on LinkedIn, especially on people resigning and detailing why. And a lot of the times it is less about the company culture and more about that manager specifically. Um, and I think it takes a new type of leader to help employees thrive these days. The reality is we don't all have psychologists on staff to really be able to help. And HR, do HR doesn't have a magic wand to make, you know, wave over these issues to make mm -hmm. them go away. Um, so I always say to leaders that they need to be more intentional, more aware, and recognizing some of the behaviors and symptoms that are that create trauma. Um, they play such a key role. And a lot of that times it's this toxic behavior we're seeing from leaders, mm -hmm. uh, which can be really difficult. So they may not realize that their words matter as much as they do. Um, so many examples all the way from, you know, the work you're doing is not acceptable, but not explaining that to one of the worst things that you could do, which is dangerous silence, right? Um, for example, if I'm on a call and you're guessing me and you're nodding your head the whole time, as a leader, I need to stop. I need to say, oh, this is a lot of guessing and this is a, or a lot of nothing. Why is why is that? Do people really agree with me or are they afraid to speak up, mm -hmm. right? So being afraid to speak up is a to toxic cultural trait, but it's very common because let's be honest, you have a livelihood. Most people work to support themselves and speaking up is something that can be very taboo, especially to your boss. So it takes an honest, wholehearted leader to really be able to stop and think about the reactions with their teams and how they can stir this environment of, um, of belonging. The reality is most don't wake up saying, oh, how can I make this a more, how can I make people feel like they belong? It's just not really what happens. So being intentional, being aware, um, and at the same time, at the that's the leader level, but at the company level, it is important for companies to assess their organizational help, health and to be able to utilize companies like Rebel Research Group, which is my belonging piece of, uh, that I run, um, and help companies get their arms around their culture to really understand what's helping and what's not. For example, a lot of times, you know, people come to Rebel Research Group and they will say to us, family, family is one of our strongest values we have at the company. Well, in reality, family means something very different to each person. And if you're calling yourselves a family, that may sound really good and breathe the sense of warmth, but Meredith, you can't fire family. Mm -hmm. And often when repercussions happen or punishments or firing in the workplace, that's why employees are taking it so much more harshly because they think that they're a part of something that may mean something different to them than it does the actual company. In reality, you can't be loyal to something that's not loyal back. 
So being able to understand what the company's values are against your own values are very important Mm -hmm. to make sure you're not in an impasse, but make sure that both can coexist Mm -hmm. and that you can thrive in the workplace. Well, there's so much to unpack there in terms of things we could look at Mm -hmm. because, you know, this whole thing of expectations of what the employee is expecting based on what the company has stated versus the reality that they actually live in, yes. that cognitive dissonance can create trauma in itself, it seems like. Oh, absolutely. Meredith, one of the most interesting things to me is when companies talk about being mission-driven, values-driven, purpose-driven. As an employee, you need to stop and ask yourself, are they talking about my values, my mission, my purpose? Or am I expected to put that company above the, my values, my mission, and my purpose? That's a, Those are really important questions that employees need to ask themselves and make sure they're in sync with. And if they're not, consider a better fit for themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, being clear on what your values are and the companies, if they're not in alignment, you're going to have this uh, stress, I would think, most yeah. of the time because you're being asked to do things that just violate what yeah. what is important to you, what you, and I guess that goes back to the whole, you know, selection, mm-hmm. talent acquisition, being clear up front with candidates yes. about what's valued and then candidates feeling that they can, once they get hired, openly address when there's there's a, a disconnect between what they were told and what they're living in yeah. the workplace. And it goes back to your mentioning, you know, this feeling of safety and speaking up. What are the consequences if I state what I'm observing? Yes. And, you know, can I do that? I think the the price is high when companies don't allow or foster that kind of open communication. Yeah, that and um, something you said sparked the fact that a lot of the times it's not that these companies it, it don't want to, um, you know, embrace your values, but a lot of the times they have a hard enough time embracing their own, right? They have aspirational values that they put out there or they're not necessarily living them. And that's a red flag for um, employees. So if you are someone looking to join a company, that's why you ask around. You know, I, I see here... The, the values are family, trust, and integrity. Do you feel that the company actually lives those values? Mm-hmm. That's important to ask as well, especially when you are going to a, di- a new company. Yes. And you need to make sure that you're there for the long run. And, you know, thinking about that and how people do talk, they do use so much social media. Mm-hmm. The, the executives in a company really need to consider and even ask. Their employees, you know, if someone were to ask you, is this a great place to work? How would you respond? Yes. You know? And ask right. them firsthand, assuming they feel safe giving, a, you know, an honest answer. Yes. It would help draw out where are the issues that we're not addressing that are causing this person to hesitate to say, I love working here, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like, There's certain questions you can ask to do that, Right. So what is it like to work there? You might get a little bit of a canned answer. Maybe if you try a question like, um, what's your manager like? You're going to get a much more interesting answer that might lead to a broader understanding of how the company works itself. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Well, Beth, we could keep talking. I love um, (laughs) your insights and everything you've you've learned from your research, your own experience. So I want to have my audience know how they can learn more about you, how they can connect with you and learn more about your research company. Thank you so much. And thanks again for having me, Meredith. Uh, Listeners can connect in a variety of ways on LinkedIn. There's a belonging at work group that they can join. Um, A lot of great conversation occurs there. A lot of great knowledge share. Um, You can also go to Rebel Research Group's website, which is belongingatwork.com and check out the services um, and also knowledge that we share there. And then there's also workshops, assessments, policy revamps, et cetera, that companies can look at to see if that's something they're interested in as well. And then, of course, 
when we talk about social media, right? Instagram belonging at work is also a popular group that people have started to gravitate towards. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm so glad you have these various groups started so people can learn more about it. And if they are in a leadership role, get Mm -hmm. some ideas of how to build that into their own companies and their own teams in a really positive way. Beth, thank you so much for who you are and the work that you're doing. I admire so much the the energy you have put into bringing this topic to light. And I think another thing we could recommend is for people to really connect with you on LinkedIn so they can yes. see when you publish articles um, in a variety of publications because you're an excellent writer and Thank you. you share really great and important information around this whole topic, which is, you know, universal. It's important to every single human being. So thank you again for coming on today. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning into my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.